God bless everyone out there. May the Spirit of God give you the ears to hear. This is Sister Liberty Lane back here again with another teaching for you. So there's a lot of different things that I am meditating on and that I'm thinking about. But one that has just truly been a blessing is being reminded of testimonies, not just mine, but others, brothers and sisters, just the power behind it, the power of these testimonies, how there's so much of God's goodness. There's so much of God's favor. There's so much of God's hands on these testimonies. And that's one vital reason why we have to constantly rehearse. So, you know, you have what is known as memorials, but it's vital, it's important to rehearse your testimonies. And many, you know, it's good to share. Now, not every testimony you share because not every testimony is for everyone. Some testimonies are between you and God. But then there are just those testimonies that when you release them, there's power power and grace released on those testimonies and your testimonies now becomes that person's testimony because that person received the power of God on your words and through your testimony. So I thought about what Revelation says in chapter 12 and this came to my mind as I was just thinking on testimonies and how encouraged I am to see other brothers and sisters rehearsing their testimonies and expressing gratitude like that's a great place to be when you have so much to be grateful for because you know it's only God that's keeping you. You know that you would not be here without God. I would not be here without God. I know that it's only God keeping me. I'm going to get to the scripture. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm overwhelmed. I'm excited. So last night, as I was reading Proverbs, I was just sitting there and I was like, Lord, I don't want to go back. I don't want the world. The world has nothing to offer me because there's so much peace in God. There's so much strength in God. There's so much joy in God. There's so much safety in God. And remembering what things was like in the world, it keeps me from going back. We return back to the world. We go back to our vomit when we forget what things were like when we forget how hard things were in the world then we forget we forget so i was just thinking last night of how much peace i have in god and how i'm happy and how i don't miss those days of drama i don't miss those days of paranoia feeling as though something or someone is out to get me i feel fully content in god and so i'm grateful for that and I'm also grateful for the testimonies because I know had it not been for God, I don't know where I would be right now. I don't want to know, but I know if it was not for God saving me right now, I would be either six feet under or I would be a broken person, a dead person walking the planet, walking the world, doing what everyone else is doing. And so I really like this scripture in Revelation 12 verse 11. It says, and they overcame him and when it says them, it's talking about the sons of God. It's talking about the believers. It says, and they overcame him. Who is him? Him is the enemy, the serpent, the beast. By the blood of the lamb. So not only do we overcome by our testimony, but Jesus' testimony that was written out in blood. His blood. There's power in his blood to save. That's why his blood was sufficient enough to forgive men of their sins. His blood was sufficient. It was good enough. It was more than enough. The word of God says that it pleased the father to bruise his son, his only son. So we're overcoming by the blood of the lamb. His, his blood, not our blood, his blood. There's power in it. There's grace in it. There's hope in it. His blood there, there's so much strength in it that's why we're going to be able to overcome as long as we remember that it was through God and it says and by the word of their testimony the word of their testimony is 
a constant rehearsal of what God has done, remembering what God has done. And this scripture made so much more sense to me after I read Acts a couple of times and you read Paul's life earlier on and his first encounter with God on his way to Damascus to persecute some Christians, to kill some Christians, to capture some Christians. And on his way back, he meets the Lord. The Lord appears through a light and he begins to speak to Paul and he began, or I think at that time he was called Saul. So he begins to speak to Saul and he asks him a question. He asks him, why do you persecute me? Why do you kick against the prick? And then he tells Saul what he's going to do and what he's going to suffer for his namesake. And so Paul, who eventually became, or Saul, who eventually became Paul, he shared this testimony whenever he would go before King Agrippa or other great men. He would always rehearse that testimony of, yeah, you know, I used to kill Christians. I used to be a Pharisee. I used to do these things. But then Jesus met me on the way. He would constantly bring that up. And you can tell that that was something Paul did within himself, that he was always reminded of. What God did for him and how God saved him. God did not have to reveal himself to Paul in that way. God could have left Paul the way that he was. Thinking that what he was doing. All that that zeal he had for the Lord. He could have left him believing that this, this was the way. That what he was doing was right. But God interrupted the process. God would do things like that. God will interrupt a person's life. And I love when he does it at such an early age. Now Paul wasn't you know, young. But there are many of us who I know the Lord. He got us when we were young. Now most of you. You may not like that. You may think that a young person. Should not commit their lives to the Lord. Because they have their whole lives ahead, ahead of them. I've heard that so many times. You know you're too young. You should go out and live your life. You should go out and experiment. You should go out and explore. You should go out and have a life. Don't commit. Don't get into that so soon. Don't get into that so early. You know, that's a big commitment. But the word of God says that it is better to serve your creator in your youth. Because over time, especially when you're in the world, over time we've learned. We learn to build up walls of resentment, of bitterness, of stubbornness because you've experienced so much of the world that you feel as though, you know, you've done it all. You've seen it all. No one can tell you. And at that point, you know, when you should commit to God, when you should come to God, it's a lot harder because you have all of these wounds from the world you have all of this trauma. You have all of these bad experiences. Your mind is warped. Your mind has been so conditioned because you believe that it's better to live your life first and then come to God last. Most people never make it to that point. Most people never get to a place where they've lived their life because the world beats you up sin beats you up sin destroys you the devil destroys you he comes to steal to kill and to destroy and so thinking that i can just live my life now and then come to god later it isn't a reality it isn't something that's common or necessarily true i'm not saying you know you have one in every Million people or a thousand people get saved, you know, being in their 40s and in their 50s and however else, you know, God can do anything. But the point that I'm making is it is better to serve the Lord in your youth when you are young and fresh and still malleable, still moldable, still shapeable. You can receive your heart is open. It hasn't been condition with the ways of the world your mind hasn't been so conditioned with the ways of the world because i'm telling you many of us who were in the world we're still getting the world off of us and we were not in the world long when i when i say that i mean many of us got saved 
in our early 20s or our late teens. And so we don't have 30 years of the world on us. We don't have 50 years. We don't have 60 years. We don't have 25 years of the world on us that we have to get off. But the little bit that we do have that tells you just how bad the world is and how messed up it is. That although this person was in the world for 15 years, 16 years, 17 years, there's still so much that has to be undone. There's still layers because you've baked in the world. You've, you've been baked. You've been conditioned. You've been groomed to be a particular way, especially if you live here in America. So that has to come off of the believer. And so holding on to our testimonies, believing the power of our testimonies, knowing that through this, remembering what God has done for me is going to sustain me. That's why when you're going through things, it's good to remember, well, what has God done for me? Some people feel as though, you know, well, what has God done for me lately? That's an ungrateful heart. That person is ungrateful. That person is entitled to things. That person feel as, feels as though God owes them. But when I can look at the small things, so a testimony doesn't have to be some grand, huge catastrophical, life-threatening, life and death story, almost dying in a car accident, being in a club, being shot, <laughs> you know, driving off a cliff, almost falling to your death. It doesn't have to be some huge thing where you were in prison, you were selling drugs, you got you got caught by an undercover cop. It doesn't have to be something like that. It can just be something so simple as God answered your prayer. God healed your headache. You had a headache. You prayed for it. You were commanding it to go and God healed it. You were praying for your leg or you were talking to the Lord or maybe you just had a thought. What's even greater is when God answers your thoughts. He's so good. He answers like it was just a thought. You didn't even pray. You didn't even pray. You didn't even speak it out of your mouth. It was just a thought. But God is so good that he answers even our thoughts. And so a testimony doesn't have to be so elaborate and magnet. You know, it can be something very simple, very small that, you know, you had a thought and God answered your thought. You know, you were thinking about that person and you prayed for that person and then you saw that person. You found out that that person was doing better or, you know, maybe God allowed someone to bless you. However he did it, the testimony, it doesn't have to be be big. It can be very small. It can be very simple. And sometimes we, we overlook the small things. We overlook the areas where God is present in our lives and he's already doing things because we're looking for that big bang. We're looking for something so huge and so grand. And God is saying, the fact that I woke you up this morning in your right mind is a testimony. And that's that's true for me. That, that's my testimony this morning. You need a testimony every day because you need evidence of knowing that God is in your life. That God is with you and you're with him. It's not enough to just say I'm saved. What evidence do you have? How do you know that you're saved? What evidence? Because if you are not having testimonies, if you don't have evidence, then how are you so sure? How do you know? Is it because you carry a Bible? Is it because you know the Bible? Is it because you've gone to seminary school? If I don't have any testimonies, then I can't know. I can't be confident in knowing that I'm, that I'm really saved. But if I have a record, if I have history, if I have evidence, if I have memorials, then I can look to those knowing that no God's hand is on my life. No, God is with me. He woke me up in my right mind, as they say, and started me on my way. That is true because everybody doesn't have their mind. God gives the man of God, the woman of God, their mind to think the right way, to have some common sense. Because if you know anything about the world that we're living in, God is stripping men from their common sense. <laughs> Seriously. He's stripping men, meaning people are doing things that requires common sense, but they're doing it as if they don't have that. They're doing it as if something is happening in their minds. Something is happening and this person may not be on drugs. This person may not be a drunkard, a drunkard, but the simple fact that this person, they're doing things or they're making decisions that is showing that something is happening in men's mind. Why did that person leave their baby up top of the car? Because you know, someone did that. Someone did that. I don't know if they were having a bad day. But someone left their baby in a car seat up top of the vehicle and decided to back out. 
Thankfully, a cashier saw it and she was able to get the person's attention. But when I heard that, I said, yes, God is stripping men from their common sense. But for the man of God, God gives the man of God his sense. God gives the son of God his sense. He gives the man of God his mind. Yeah, he gives you your mind so that you can think right. So that you can think like a believer. So that you can think like a son and not like a vain person. Not like a person who you're just living to survive. People who live to survive, they make all kinds of decisions. Bad decisions. Decisions that will put other people's lives at risk because they're... they're living for self they have a fight or flight mentality you know they don't know when the next thing is going to come they live a life of paranoia because that's what happens when you're in the world when you're in sin you live a life of paranoia the word of god says that the wicked flees when no man pursues him and i remember being in that place feeling as though someone is out to get me someone's watching me i don't know when you're in sin it's a different kind of world it's a different kind of feeling but I do remember being in sin and feeling as though someone's going to get me, feeling as though, man, something's going to happen to me. I remember those feelings and that's a good place to be at is remembering how bad it was. Because if I forget what Egypt was like, then the likelihood is I'm going to go back. I'm going to return. I'm going to want to return. I'm going to desire those things that were back in Egypt. So I can't forget how bad it was. I can't forget those nights of depression, those nights of discouragement, those nights of hopelessness. I can't forget those days of feeling insecure and feeling inadequate and unvaluable and unworthy. I can't forget. So that's why the believer has to constantly remind themselves of the testimonies that God has done in their lives. Remembering where God has brought you from. You know, that's going to keep you at a place of gratitude and not ungratefulness, not feeling as though, well, what has God done for me lately? When I know that, no, it's only God that is keeping me, it's only God that is ordering my steps, then I'm going to always remain at a place of thankfulness and gratitude, remembering that, no, he changed my identity because I know who I was. I know who I used to be. I know the things that I used to do. Some of you know who I used to be and the things that I used to do. And seeing the transformation, that is evidence. So the transformation on a man of God's life. And this was not my original teaching today. But I, again, I, I got I got so excited. The power of testimony. So transformation in a person's life. So you know. That this person used to be this way. Man, I used to kick it with that person. Man, I used to fornicate with that person. Man, me and that person used to go clubbing together. Or we used to go and hit what they call licks together. And now you see that this person, they don't curse anymore. They don't dress the same anymore. They don't talk the same. They don't look the same. That is evidence. A person who has been transformed, that is evidence of the power of God. And that God does change. God does transform. That's a testimony in itself, knowing who this person was, knowing that this person was just as worse as you, man. This person was the one who made all the first move. That person was the life of the party. And now they're saved. Now they're changed. They talk different. They walk different. They act different. They think different. That is the power of God. That's the power of Jesus Christ and his blood that washes away our sins it makes us white as snow yeah that is the power of salvation how one can go from being this way that was paul's testimony saul's testimony paul's testimony that that was his testimony of him going from one thing and completely being changed that was his testimony he can look at that as a reference of knowing no i was in bondage i thought i was free but Apparently, I was not. Apparently, I was a slave to my own emotions. I was a slave to my world. I was a slave to people. And I was a slave to the enemy. But he opened my eyes. You see, if God doesn't open your eyes, then you can't see. You can think that you're not blind. You can think that you are free. But if he doesn't open your eyes, then you will not see. He told the Pharisees that. He says, if you could see, because they asked him, well, are we blind too? Are we blind too? Because apparently we have the law and we know the law and we obey it. So are we blind too? And Jesus told them, if you could see, if you were not blind, then you're 
sins would not remain. But you say you can see, yet your sin remained. So if I can see for real, then my life is going to communicate that I am free. My life is going to communicate that, no, I have real freedom. No, I've been transformed. No, he removed the scales off of my eyes. He did that with Paul. He blinded Paul. So after that interaction, he blinded Paul. Yeah, so sometimes you have to be blind before you can see. And he has to take you through a process so that your testimony does have power and glory on it. So Paul was blind for three days. And the Lord raised up someone, Ananias, to come and lay hands on him. To remove the scales off of his eyes. That made me think that sometimes you're going to need other people to help you on your way. So the Lord used him to remove the scales off of Paul's eyes. That's why being in the body is so important because you need people. So had not Ananias been available to go and pray for Paul, Paul's eyes would have not been open. So you need people. So Paul needed him. In that moment, Paul could not have said, well, you know, I have my own encounters with God, so I don't need you, but you're blind. <laughs> you need people. So those that are in the body, we need each other. We need people. Although you have your testimonies, you need the testimonies of others. You need the participation of others to help steer you on your way. So when Ananias came and he laid hands on Paul, the word of God says that the scales fell off of his eyes. Okay, so now he's been transformed. Now he was blind or he once was blind, but now he can see and he can see more clearly. Yeah, he has godly vision now. He had a worldly vision because he had a worldly perspective. But since encountering God and God changing his life in a moment, you have to understand that Paul was changed in a moment. That's how God works. God can change a person in a moment. That's why I don't understand when people who have been in the faith for so long can say, well, you know, God is still working on me. But if you are available, if you are open and willing God can break those things off of you in a moment. But most of the time, if people can be honest, they like certain things that, that they shouldn't like. They're holding on to things that they shouldn't be holding on to. You know, they still have a part of them that is still attached to the world and that likes the world. And so, God changed him in a moment. The power, the power of God, it changes in a moment. Like lightning. Like lightning. Yeah, that lightning came. It entered the earth's atmosphere and it struck something and it changed the state of that thing in a moment yeah that was a tree but now it's a stump <laughs> that was a tree but now it's a stump that was a light pole but now it's nothing it's just a hole in the ground when you encounter fire it changes you it changes you know fire changes the state of things it changes the condition of things i love paul's testimony it's a blessing. It's, it's, I receive his testimony. That, that's why it's even in the word of God. That's why we have the word of God. That's why we have 66 books. And we have testimonies. We have stories of men and women who walked by faith. That's what Hebrews 11 is all about. Testimonies of people who walked with God. And they walked by faith. And they walked out their faith. They, walk, they live this thing out. The man of God has to live this thing out. And as you do. You're going to see the hand of God. You're going to see God show up in ways you've never seen. So we know that we are coming into darker times and the world is going to get darker. But the sons of God are going to get brighter. The sons of God are going to see God move in a way that they've never seen before. Things that we read about are going to begin to manifest. The word of God says that eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of men those things which God has prepared for them. So God is about to do the miraculous. God is about to do the impossible thing that we've not seen yet because he's coming back and there are an order of events that must take place before he comes back. He's coming back, but before he does, there are some things that has to be released and unlocked. And as those things are taking place, he's going to pour out his spirit he promises that, I believe, in, in Joel, that he's going to pour out his spirit upon all flesh, on young men and young women. He's going to do it. He's going to do it. He's going to release power. The earth is going to get so bad. Your world is going to get so bad that God is going to have to raise up faithful men and women of God, real believers, a remnant. 
that he promises to always have in the earth. He's going to have to raise them up. He's going to have to pour out his spirit somewhere. The power and the glory has to go somewhere. Elijah's not here, but his spirit is. The mantle of Elijah is here. You know, John the Baptist isn't here, but his spirit is. And that power has to go somewhere. It has to go into a vessel, an earthen vessel. It has to go into someone who's available, who's not distracted, who's not caught up in the world, but someone who's open. Someone who can say, here I am, Lord, send me. That power has to go. It has to go. And so the believer has to remain open. The believer has to remain grateful. It's crazy when I meet professed believers who are ungrateful. Like, God gave you your breath. <laughs> he gave you your breath. First of all, you're, you're breathing his air. And the breath that you do breathe is his breath. The fact that you have two eyes and they're open, you're not blind, you're not deaf. You know, you have your limbs, you're not disabled, you're not sick, you're not in a coma, you're not in a hospital, in a hospital bed. If we can just learn to be grateful, if we can just appreciate the small things like the fact that he allowed the sun to shine today. Okay, he allows the rain to fall. He allows you to be able to still go out and, and make wealth, still be able to work. He allows you to still have food on your table, a roof over your head. You're not homeless. You're not sleeping in the car. And even if you are, he's still good. Because you still have somewhere to lay your head. You're not laying in the physical street out in the cold. God is still good. So if we can appreciate the small things, then... We can appreciate the bigger things and not overlook the small things. And we can have a heart of gratitude. We can appreciate what God has done and not be looking forward. What has God done for me lately? See, you're, you're overlooking the small things. You are a prideful person. You are an entitled person. Humility, humility, excuse me, says that, no, I know it was only God. Humility says, no. God is the one who brought me to where I am. Had it not been for him, I don't know where I would be. Humility says, God, I am grateful. God, I am thankful. God, I know it was only you. Pride is going to say, what has he done for me lately? Pride is going to say, well, I've not seen him do that for me. Pride is going to say, he's not answered that prayer yet. Pride is going to say, God owes me. Those are the kind of people who miss out. Because they can't appreciate the small things that God is doing in their lives. Like the fact that they just got blessed in their bank account. Like the fact that they have food on the table. Like the fact that they have a roof over their head. They have clothes on their body. You know, you didn't wake up death. You didn't wake up in pain. You didn't wake up dead. <laughs> you know, as they say. So, there are so many different things that we can be grateful for and thank God for. And as a son of God, it's important that you rehearse your testimonies. That's how you're going to overcome. When you are in those situations. When you are going through adversity. And the opposition. And experiencing persecution. You are going to have to pull out those different testimonies. And remind yourself. On this day God did this. On this day I should have been dead. On this day the doctor said that I wasn't going to live. The doctors told me that I was going to be on medication for the rest of my life. But God. Someone had a testimony of the doctor speaking damage and death over them in their heart. And the doctors told them that they were going to be on medication for the rest of their lives. And the person began to say that they begin to feel fingers. They begin to feel fingers in their heart working. And before they knew it, they found out later that their heart, the condition that the doctor said... They had and that they were going to be on medication for the rest of their lives. They found out that God had healed their heart. That their heart was healed. And now this person is not on medication. Has never been on medication. Decided that they were not going to take the medication. And they're not on medication. But the doctors told them that they were not going to live unless they take this medication. That they would be taking for the rest of their lives. But God. But God. So this person decided that they were going to trust God and believe God and God healed their heart. Not just physically, but spiritually. You know, when God does things for us in our lives, things are not just happening physically, but also spiritually. 
So Paul, him being blind and the scales being removed off of his eyes, that wasn't just physical. That was spiritual. So he was blinded to so many different things that he thought he could see. But when God removed the scales, he could see so much clearly. Clear. So when God takes away the scales, he takes away the scabs on our eyes. I forget what Revelation calls it. But he takes... I, I think I sad for something. I think it's I sad. I think that's what it is. When he takes that away, you can see so much more clear. There are so many things that I either used to watch or I used to know or music that I would listen to. And every now and then if I come across it, let's say I'm in a grocery store and I hear that song playing or I see that TV show being advertised and I'm familiar with it because I used to watch it. And, you know, sometimes I hear the song and then there's things in the song that's very clear, you know, very obvious that this person is either satanic or they're dealing with depression or they're dealing with anxiety. It's in the music. And I'm like, whoa, the whole time that was there, I used to sing this. Does people know this person is talking about suicide? Does people know this person is singing about the devil or this show has 666 that was there the whole time yeah there was a children's show that i watched growing up and some years ago i was watching it i was said i was watching it and one day i was watching it and 666 came across the screen and i had to rewind and pause it was on netflix and i had to go back because i had to make sure i was not tripping and i was like wait a minute i grew up watching this show so you mean to tell me the whole time this was there this was there the whole time. That was in the song the whole time. The whole time the person was singing about uh, singing about talking to the dead. The whole time the person was sing, singing about selling their soul. The person was singing about giving up their virginity. Man, how come I couldn't hear that? How come I missed that? How come I couldn't see that? It was because I was blind. Once he opened my eyes, then I was able to see things more clearly. When God opens your eyes... You are able to see things for what they are and not what they appear to be. Meaning this thing looks like one thing, but it's really another. When he opens your eyes, you see things for what it is. You see beyond the screen. You see the background. You see how the devil is in the details. You see what others can't. Most people don't see anything wrong with this show, but you see what's really there. Oh, no. There's demons in the background. Oh, no. This person is communicating pedophilia. No, this person is communicating homosexuality. You don't see that? This person is encouraging adultery. This person is encouraging, you know, sex trafficking. You don't see that. You don't hear that. You don't hear what they're singing in the music. You don't hear what they're communicating. There's so much. I'm telling you, the devil is running the planet. He's running the planet. <laughs> he's, and he's doing a really good job. He's running the planet because he's deceiving so many people. He is. But for the man of God... We have to stand on the promises of God in the testimonies, our testimonies, what God has done for us, where he's brought us from, what he's delivered you from. You know, it was nothing but God. You know, many of you, you should have been in jail. You were supposed to be sentenced to however many years, but God made the judge let you go free. So some of us should have been behind bars. Some of us should have been sick. With an STD, with HIVs, but God. Some of us should have been sprung out on drugs right now and crack cocaine. Because of the life that we were living, but God. Some of us should have been beat down, busted and disgusted right now. Out on the streets, panhandling, bagging for money, but God. Some of us should have been in a crazy house. Because we know the kinds of things we were doing. And we know the people we used to be with. But God. God saved us God saved them that's that's the best feeling in the world knowing that you are rescued it's almost as if you're drowning in a pool and the word of God says where did I not save you when you were drowning in your own pool of blood that is the truth that is the God-given truth many of us were drowning in our own blood our own blood suffocating dying Although we were living physically, we were dying spiritually and eventually physically we would have been dead. But he rescued us out of the world. Do you understand 
I need you to understand something for just, just a moment. Do you understand that God is not saving everyone? I want you to understand that. There are many people that God is walking by. So if you think that being saved is so simple and simple as just saying yes to God and getting baptized and giving your life to God, it does not work like that. It does not. You don't choose God. God chooses you. That's what Jesus says. He says, no man can come to the Father except the Father calls him. I was also thinking about another verse where he says how, you know, the Father chose these. The Father, I think it's when he's praying in maybe John 17. Yeah, the, I think he says the Father, the Father has given these to me. God does the choosing. God does the picking. Yeah. Yeah, he does say that. For I have given unto them the words which thou gave me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I am come from you, and they have believed that you did send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, or I pray, yeah, I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me. That's what Jesus says in red letter words. Yeah. And all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. So he says, all of these you've given me. So respect the fact that God does the choosing. God is not saving everyone. You think it's just easy to be saved? It's, oh, all I got to do is just say yes and commit and go to church. If the Spirit of God does not draw you, God has to draw you. He has to put that desire in you. Why do you think it's so hard to come to God anyways? He's not calling everyone. He's not breathing on everyone. He's not reviving everyone. He didn't do it in, the, in, in these times, in these days, in the Word of God. He didn't do that with everyone. There were, there were many sick people who had the palsies, who had other disabilities, who were blind, who were deaf, that he walked by. Because he's not called to everyone. He's not called to the proud. He's called to the lost sheep. He's called to the sick. He says those that are whole... They don't need a physician. Know that are uh, okay because you have people who are perfectly fine. Although they're they have disabilities, although they're deaf and they're blind, they are completely okay with their condition and they don't mind remaining in that condition. That is the world. You have people that are in the world and you know they're messed up. They're messed up. Life is hard, but they a part of them enjoys it. A part of them enjoys the drama. A part of them enjoys the trauma. A part of them enjoys the the fast life and the adventure and the excitement and the thrill and the I forget what they call it. I forget the name. Not overdrive. Drilling rush. You know, you got people they, they enjoy the, the drill. They 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 like it. They like the thrill. They like the entertainment. All those things are messed up. They like it. So you can have a person who's sick. You can have a person who who has leprosy or has the palsies or you know has one short limb and be completely okay remaining in that condition you have people like that in the world who's sick but they don't think that they're sick but they are sick and so they remain in that condition they remain in that state you have a person who goes to the hospital and they tell the doctor that they're fine because they don't want the doctor to operate on them. The doctor wants to give you what you need. You're going to have to undergo this. You may not like it and it may not be fun, but you're going to feel better. And because you don't want to go through the process because you don't want <laughs> them touching you. Because you don't want to go under the knife. You don't want to get that surgery, that open heart surgery that's needed to save your life. You convince yourself that you'll be okay. That it'll, Maybe it'll heal on its own. Maybe it'll get better on its own. That's the deception of the world. Thinking that things in the world are going to get better. That's that person who's on the operating table who does not want to undergo the process. They want to convince themselves that things will get better on its own. Because that's what the world believes anyways. That's what they're teaching the people of the world anyways is that things will get better over time. Just give it some time. Just give it some time and things will get better. Give it some time and that thing will heal on its own. But, you know, some things you can't just put a band-aid on. Some things won't heal on their own. And if they do, they won't heal the proper way. They won't heal the right way. There will still be some openness underneath. So, if it's a big wound that requires stitches and you want to put a band-aid on it. Because I, I know people who, 
Maybe they didn't have insurance. Maybe they didn't, they didn't want to go to the hospital and they just kind of did a quick fix. And, you know, now they're still paying underneath that. Although the top layer, it looks healed and a part of it is healed. They're still paying underneath, meaning there's still a whole open womb underneath that scar. Yeah, I have an injury like that where it, it healed on the surface level on the top. But if you press it, if you pressed out on it, there's still some pain there. Yeah. That's the condition of man's heart. Man is sick. Man needs a savior. If man convince itself that he's not sick and that he is okay, then he will remain in that condition. And Jesus will walk right by him. Jesus walks past people. Yeah. He walks past people. The man of God has to be grateful. There's so many different things to be grateful for. I have to be grateful for what God has done in my life. The power of God is real. And he does transform. He does renew a person's mind. He does give a person their mind back. He does breathe on a person. And he does renew them. He makes them whole. He makes them strong. He gives them a reason to live. Many of us try to commit suicide at different points of our lives. But now that we have life, we have a reason to live. And it's a beautiful thing to know that you are in the Lord because everyone can't say that. Everyone can't wake up and say, wow, I'm in the Lord, man, I'm saved. Most of you don't know who I used to be and what I used to be. And listen, I'm, I'm glad for your sake. <laughs> the fact that God saved me, I'm, I'm glad for your sake because I know what I was and who I used to be and what I used to do. So I can't imagine being in sin for 30 30. One year is my God, Jesus. The heartache and the pain, I'm telling you, the world is eating people alive. Sometimes I see people who I went to high school with, you know, every now and then they pop up. And you can just see the darkness. You can see how the world got to them. How the world is eating them up alive. How sin is beating them up. Like, man, that person, they look older than me. I'm older than them. They look older than me. That person looks broken. Sometimes you can see behind the images on Facebook. Because, you know, we can do a really good job with putting up a facade, putting up a front. But many times you can see the darkness on people behind the image. Because there's a spirit that governs the world that's on people. The spirit of darkness. The spirit of Satan is on people. You can see that. You can see that. So I'm glad for your sake that he saved me. Only God knows where I would have been. And I'm grateful because I know that he didn't have to. There was nothing that I did or said that said, God, pick me. He chose me because he wanted to. God chooses because he wants to. He wants to. He does what so. God does whatsoever pleases him. Well, he does whatever he wants. And I'm learning that God does whatever he wants. So when he's choosing a person. It's because he likes the person. It's because he loves the person. It's because he wants to use the person. And it's it's the best feeling in the world to know that you belong. To know that you are chosen. To know that you are wanted. To know that you are owned. To know that you are accepted. To know that you are affirmed. To know that you have an identity. That is the best feeling in the world to feel the love of God. For him to break every chain. For him to destroy the works of sin off of your life, off of your mind. To undo the, the heavy burdens, to break off the yokes. That is the best feeling, feeling in the world when you are free. Oh my goodness. You, Many of us were a slave to certain things. And sin, like there were just certain things we couldn't stop doing. But the power of God is real, I'm telling you. The power of God is real. <laughs> he will give you power to not sin anymore. Believe me. There were things that I used to believe were impossible. Like no. There is no way a person cannot, cannot engage that. No. there's You can't convince me. But God, con God convinced me. God did it. God showed me that this is how he works. So when the word of God says that all things are possible with God. You better believe that that is true. With God, nothing shall be impossible. That is real. He can do, listen, the way God says that he can use the foolish things. God can do, God can do anything. You have to believe that. He can take 
the worst of criminals and he can transform them. I'm telling you. If he did it for me, I'm glad for your sakes that, that I'm saved. I'm glad for your sakes that he saved me. But if he can save Saul, he can save anyone. You realize he was he was a murderer. He was killing people. He was right there when they stoned Stephen. Yet God saved him. So God is not afraid of sin. God is not afraid of the worst criminal in the United States. He can change that person in a moment. He can break chains off of that person in a moment. He can break yokes off of that person in a moment. And if he can do it for us, he can do it for you. If he can do it for the people in the word of God, he can do it for you. There's nothing too hard. There's nothing too big for God. Sin is not too big. Sin is not a great thing that God can't save that person. God can't deliver that person. It is true that with God, all things are possible. <laughs> so we are grateful. We are grateful for everything that God has done and is doing in our lives. So the man of God, he overcomes by the blood of the lamb in the word of his testimony. Speak your testimony out. Rehearse it. Write it down. Make memorials. That's why we do these things. That's why we are we are encouraged to do these things so that you can have track record, so that you can have evidence of God in your life. Oh no, I know that God is real because he did this on September 18th, 2001. God did this. You know? December 11th, 1998. God did this. Oh no, I remember where I was and how he found me. Yeah, you were shooting heroin in your arms, into your body. And God manifested in the form of an angel. He manifested in the form of a light and spoke to you and told you to stop. You were about to put the gun to your mouth, into your head. And God let someone call out your name, Jesus. He let someone call out your name. You were alone. But someone someone called out your name. You were about to jump off of this bridge to your death. But God called out your name. Or he let your name be called out. You just heard someone calling your name. You heard someone call your name and it, it shot fear down within your soul. So you got down off of the bridge. You put the gun down. You put the drugs down. You put the alcohol down. You put the blade down. Yeah, you were about to take your life. You were about to end it because you felt as though there's no reason to live. But then God showed up. I'm telling you, people have testimonies. People have testimonies. And many times, you know, your first encounters with God is how God sees you. Your first encounter. Yeah, that's going to be the makeup of your calling. That's going to be the makeup of your purpose. Yeah, I remember how he, how he introduced himself to me. You know, my, my personal testimony was my encounter of hell. That's how God decided to engage me. That's that's how he decided to, his first interaction with me was of, of hell and him saving me out of the pits of hell. Your testimony may be different and may look different, you know. <sighs> yes, yeah, so we are grateful. We are grateful for all that God is doing and we bless God and we thank God and we appreciate the deliverance we appreciate the freedom the freedom is the freedom that God gives you and I'm gonna be I'm gonna be done when I say this <laughs> the freedom that God gives you is nothing compared to the freedom that's in the world you can be free in the world and still be in a, be in bondage but when God frees you you are free every which way you are whole every which way you're freeing your mind you're freeing your emotions. You're freeing your life. You're free to follow him. No restraints. No barriers. No limitations. Oh no, I'm free now. Oh, the devil messed up. Oh no, when he lost me, he lost a good one. You could tell hell I'm not coming. I am what Jesus took from Satan and I'll always be. I'll always be that. Yeah. So this is our lives. We rehearse our testimonies. We speak. It says they spoke. Or they, how did it say it? And overcome by the, or they, he, I think it says their words, your words, your words, your words. A person can't have words if they're not speaking. That would mean I would have to speak forth, speak out my testimony. Yeah, That's how I overcome remembering what God has done for me. There's power in that. 
there's power in that. Oh no, I'm going to overcome this time because he got me through the last time. So I already know how this works. Yeah. So God bless you in Jesus name.